So ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the highlight of this evening, the SLMA Oration 2020. So I kindly request our dignitaries at the head table to be seated along with the audience for the SLMA Oration. And ladies and gentlemen, this year's orator is Professor Sachit Mehtananda, Professor and Head of the Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. So I cordially invite Professor Indika Karunathilaka to introduce and invite the orator. Over to you, sir. Professor Sachit Mehtananda is at present the Professor in Pediatrics at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, and Head of the Department. He's attached as a consultant pediatrician to the Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Ragama. Having obtained his MBBS degree from the University of Colombo with many accolades, he went on to do his postgraduate studies, firstly, the Diploma in Child Health in 2007, at which he obtained the prestigious SLCP gold medal and following this MD in pediatrics from the University of Colombo. He then obtained a DPhil from Oxford in 2015 and FRCP from Edinburgh in 2020. Professor Mittanand has also served numerous awards, including the President's Award for Scientific Publications in 2011, 2015, and 2016, the 10 Outstanding Young Persons in Sri Lanka Award 2016 in Medical Research and Commonwealth Scholarship Award in 2012. He has also received several awards during the sessions held by the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Annual Congress of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. His research publications are many in number, including 12 H-Index publications, and he has additionally authored four book chapters and over 60 peer-reviewed publications. In addition to his numerous accomplishments in both National Thalassemia Council of Sri Lanka and National Health Research Council of Sri Lanka, and serves as an editorial board member of the Ceylon Medical Journal and Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health. And again, on a personal note, Sajit has been a student of mine, Fubius Junior, at the Colombo Medical School, and later at the same, uh, the Old Boys Association of the same school. So it's a great pleasure and privilege to present this year's SLMA orator, Professor Sajit Mittananda, and award the orator's medal to him. Good evening. May General Dr. Sanjeev Munasinghe, Secretary to the Ministry of Health, Dr. Dujipa Samarasekara, the guest of honor of the today's event, Professor Indika Karunathilaka, the President, and the other office bearers of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Council members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, distinguished invitees joining on site today, as well as online, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the President and the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for awarding me the honor of delivering SLMA Oration 2020. I consider it as a great honor to deliver the most prestigious oration of the association. During the next 30 to 40 minutes, I intend to present our ongoing work on improving standards of care for children with thalassemia in Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, thalassemia is one of the most common genetic disorders in the world, which is particularly common in the tropical regions, including South Asia. Worldwide, approximately 70,000 children are born with various forms of thalassemia each year. 
beta thalassemia, which has a carrier frequency of 2.8%, is the commonest genetic disease in Sri Lanka. Approximately 1,800 patients with beta thalassemia are treated in 26 different centers in Sri Lanka at present. However, over two-thirds of them are managed in three largest thalassemia centers located in Kurunagala, Anuradhapura, and Ragama Teaching Hospitals. Of the various subtypes of thalassemia, beta thalassemia major and hemoglobin E or HBE beta thalassemia are the commonest subtypes in Sri Lanka. A recent island-wide survey reported that 70% of patients with thalassemia in the country has beta thalassemia major, whereas 20% has HBE beta thalassemia. The remainder has rare forms of thalassemia. Beta thalassemia is caused by genetic mutations in the human beta globin gene, which is located on chromosome 11. These mutations decrease the production of beta globin chains by interfering various stages of gene expression and they demonstrate autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. Beta thalassemia major, the severe most form of beta thalassemia is caused by inheritance of two beta thalassemia mutations in the homozygous state. In contrast, the molecular basis of HBE beta thalassemia is complex and complicated. In HBE beta thalassemia, one allele of the human beta globin gene carries a beta thalassemia mutation, whereas the other allele carries beta E mutation. Beta E mutation is a mutation that results in structurally abnormal hemoglobin, hemoglobin E. Hemoglobin E is a functional hemoglobin which is synthesized at reduced rates. Depending on the level of HBE produced, the severity of HBE beta thalassemia varies from a mild asymptomatic disease to a severe disease which is transfusion dependent. All severe forms of beta thalassemia result in profound anemia. These patients present during first year of life with pallor, hepatomegaly, and bony changes. They require monthly blood transfusions and are transfusion dependent for life. Regular transfusions lead to accumulation of iron, which gets deposited in many organ systems, including liver, heart, pancreas, and endocrine organs resulting in their, in their dysfunction. To counteract, patients with thalassemia are prescribed iron chelator medications life low. Allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is the only available cure for beta thalassemia at present. However, it is routinely recommended only to patients who are HLA match sibling donors, who have HLA match sibling donors due to complications related to this procedure. Consequently, stem cell transplantation is offered to mere 10% of patients with beta thalassemia. Therefore, a vast majority of patients with beta thalassemia, those who live in developing countries like Sri Lanka in particular, are managed medically with blood transfusions and iron chelation for life. Most of the recent interest in the field of beta thalassemia has been on the discovery of curative therapies. Several pathways, including inhibition of mediators of ineffective erythropoiesis, upregulation of fetal hemoglobin by hydroxuria, transfer of normal beta globin gene using gene therapy, and improving globin gene imbalance by genome editing are being tested at various stages of preclinical studies and clinical trials. Notably, several dozens of patients with beta thalassemia have already been cured by gene therapy in multiple trials. 
With this background, it is indeed reasonable for us to postulate that the cure for all patients with beta thalassemia will be available in the near future. However, poor medical management during the early years of life could lead to multiple complications related to chronic anemia and iron overload that would render patients unsuitable for these emerging therapies. Therefore, all clinicians caring for patients with beta thalassemia have a duty to optimize available supportive treatment to enable these patients to live a near normal life until a permanent cure is available and to be free of serious complications that would exclude them from such therapy. The current situation in Sri Lanka. Although the medical management of beta thalassemia have improved considerably during the past 10 to 15 years, many patients in Sri Lanka still do not survive beyond the fourth decade. This is in contrast to higher life expectancies, usually up to the sixth decade, among patients with beta thalassemia managed medically in the developed world. Many factors could contribute to this disparity, which are understudied in Sri Lanka. One important factor can be related to the adequacy of blood transfusions, especially in the subset of patients with HBE beta thalassemia. The medical management and transfusion therapy for beta thalassemia are governed by the guidelines published by the Thalassemia International Federation in 2014. These guidelines are unambiguous and comprehensive and provide clear recommendations for the management of patients with beta thalassemia major. However, these, nor any other guideline available, provide sufficient guidance on transfusion therapy for patients with HBE beta thalassemia. Therefore, it is important to assess the adequacy of blood transfusion and clinical behavior of patients with beta thalassemia to provide scientific evidence to develop uniform guidelines to guide management of HBE beta thalassemia. Another important aspect that has been has not received adequate attention during recent times is iron overload and related complications. Despite the improvements in chelation with oral medication, most of the premature deaths in Sri Lanka are still due to iron overload. Hence, it is timely that we revisit the guidance on the assessment and management of iron overload of patients with beta thalassemia. Furthermore, beta thalassemia has transformed from a fatal disease with high mortality to a chronic disease which requires increasing attention to psychological health and quality of life. Several studies done in the past when the medical care of thalassemia was relatively poor showed that the patients with beta thalassemia experience significantly poor quality of life. However, large-scale studies assessing the same after improvement in medical care are sparse. Therefore, in this oration, I aim to provide answers to these outstanding questions through a series of research studies conducted in Sri Lanka. Firstly, I aim to present a comprehensive analysis of the adequacy of blood transfusion in patients with beta thalassemia major and HBE beta thalassemia. Secondly, I intend to evaluate the body iron status and trends of iron among overload among these patients. Thirdly, I will describe the quality of life among pediatric patients with beta thalassemia, again emphasizing the differences between beta thalassemia major and HBE beta thalassemia. Finally, I aim to determine the prevalence of psychological symptoms among patients with beta thalassemia to determine the factors associated with psychological health. We performed a series of multi-centered research studies from 2017 to 2019 in the three largest thalassemia centers situated in Kurunagala, Andradapura and Ragama teaching hospitals that care for over two-thirds of patients with thalassemia in Sri Lanka. These studies were confined to the pediatric age group. 
old regularly transfused patients with beta thalassemia who were aged between 2 to 18 years and attending thalassemia centers of above mentioned hospitals were included. Regular transfusions was defined as receiving transfusions more frequently than 6 weekly. Patients with non-transfusion dependent thalassemia and thalassemia intermedia were not included in these studies. A total of 328 patients from three units were studied, of which 47% were males. 58% were from Kurunagala Thalassemia Center, 29 and 13% respectively were from Anuradhapura and Ragama Thalassemia Centers. 83% of patients with beat, had beta thalassemia major, whereas 16% had HBE beta thalassemia. Blood transfusion therapy. The Thalassemia International Federation guideline recommends maintaining a pre-transfusion hemoglobin level about 9 to 10, between 9 to 10.5 grams per deciliter in all patients with transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. By transfusing leukodepleted packed red blood cells 2 to 5 weekly. Aims of transfusion are to correct anemia and its complications, suppress bone marrow activity and extramedullary erythropoiesis, promote normal growth and normal physical activity. All patients in our study in all three centers received regular blood transfusions at two to five weekly intervals. The average pre-transfusion hemoglobin level over a six months period ranged between 4.6 to 11.7 .7, with a mean of 8.3 grams per deciliter. Only 39% of patients maintained average pre-transfusion hemoglobin level above 9 grams per deciliter, suggesting inadequate transfusions in a majority. The presence of organomegaly is another indicator of extramedullary erythropoiesis and inadequate transfusions. Among all patients in the study, 32% had hepatomegaly, 34% had splenomegaly, and 2% were splenectomized. Then we evaluated the differences in the adequacy of transfusions between beta thalassemia major and HBE beta thalassemia. This analysis showed that the pretransfusion hemoglobin level in patients with HBE beta thalassemia was significantly lower than that of beta thalassemia major. Only 4% of patients with HBE beta thalassemia had average pretransfusion hemoglobin level above 9 grams per deciliter compared to 47% of patients with beta thalassemia major. Similarly, a significantly higher proportion of patients with HBE beta thalassemia had hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. These results suggest that the patients with HBE beta thalassemia in Sri Lanka were maintaining suboptimal hemoglobin levels and were in states of chronic anemia compared to patients with beta thalassemia major. Next, we examine the annual transfusion volumes received by these patients. Although the mean, median annual transfusion volume of patients with HBE beta thalassemia was lower than that of beta thalassemia major, a large proportion of patients with HBE beta thalassemia were receiving high transfusion volumes. Notably, there was no significant difference in the proportion of patients receiving transfusion volumes over 200 milliliters per kg per year in HBE beta thalassemia and beta thalassemia major subgroups. These findings suggest that though the patients with HBE beta thalassemia were in states of chronic anemia, they were receiving large transfusion volumes almost similar to that of patients with beta thalassemia major. This irony of suboptimal hemoglobin despite high transfusion volumes is most probably due to lack of consensus on the optimal pretransfusion hemoglobin levels in patients with HBE beta thalassemia. 
Unlike beta thalassemia major, the clinical severity of HBE beta thalassemia is extremely variable. Depending on the amount of HBE synthesized, the severity varies from a minor disease which does not require transfusions through a milder non-transfusion dependent thalassemia requiring occasional transfusions to severe transfusion dependent thalassemia that requires regular transfusions. As clinicians, it is our duty to identify the category to which each patient belongs to and manage appropriately. If a patient requires only occasional transfusions, he or she can be allowed to have low baseline hemoglobin as low as 6 to 7 grams per deciliter, provided the individual is asymptomatic, have normal growth and does not have rapid enlargement of the spleen. However, if a patient with hemoglobin E beta thalassemia require regular transfusions, more frequently than six weeks, he or she should be best managed similar to beta thalassemia major by transfusing regularly to main pre-transfusion hemoglobin levels between 9 to 10.5 grams per deciliter, which is not happening at the moment in Sri Lanka. Another important aspect that we examined was transfusion transmitted infections which pose great risk to the patients with beta thalassemia. In our cohort, 20% of patients were diagnosed with hepatitis C infection. This high figure raises serious concerns over the safety of blood products and reflects the limitations of effective screening of blood donors. Hepatitis C infection is also known to increase the annual transfusion requirements of patients with thalassemia. This was confirmed by our results which showed that the median annual transfusion volume among patients with hepatitis C was significantly higher compared to others. Additionally, our study revealed that the pre-transfusion hemoglobin levels of patients with splenomegaly and hepatomegaly were significantly lower compared to patients without organomegaly. Furthermore, median annual transfusion volumes were significantly higher in patients who are underweight. All these results are published in our recent paper in the journal Pediatric Blood and Cancer. Iron overload and related complications. Iron overload is an inevitable complication of beta thalassemia. This is due to two main reasons. Firstly, the patients with beta thalassemia have inappropriate suppression of hepcidin, which in turn promotes intestinal iron absorption, despite having high body iron stores. Secondly, each packet of red blood cells infuses 200 milligrams of iron into the body by passing the intestinal regulation of iron absorption. This excess iron gets deposited in body organs including heart, liver and endocrine organs leading to organ dysfunction and failure. Thalassemia International Federation guideline recommends commencing iron chelation, commencing screening for iron overload when patient receives 10 to 12 blood transfusions. Serum ferritin is the most widely used indicator of iron overload, which should be maintained below 1000 nanograms per milliliter. Additionally, several invasive MRI based techniques that reliably measures organ specific iron load in the heart and liver are available. However, these methods are expensive and not widely available in Sri Lanka at present. The mean serum ferritin of the study population was 1,923. Only 32% of our patients had serum ferritin in the desirable range. Worryingly, 20% of patients were having very high serum ferritin, about 2,500. This was despite receiving iron chelator medications, oral deferocerox, subcutaneous desferoxamine, or combination of both which are given free of charge by the government. 
we observed significant differences in the serum ferritin level between beta thalassemia major and HBE beta thalassemia. Among patients with HBE beta thalassemia, 48% had optimal serum ferritin while only 28% of patients with beta thalassemia major had serum ferritin less than 1000. Then we looked at the prevalence of iron related complications on our, in our cohort. Short stature was the commonest complication and was present in 43% of our patients. The next common was delayed puberty which was seen in 26% of adolescents. Prevalence of cardiac dysfunction was extremely low while none of the patients had evidence of chronic liver disease. However, we did not assess the myocardial or liver iron content by MRI based techniques. With regard to other endocrine complications, 3.4% had hypothyroidism and 1.5% had diabetes. The relatively low prevalence of endocrine complications despite having high serum ferritin in a majority is most likely because our results were confined to the pediatric age group. Though the serum ferritin levels were different, we did not observe a significant difference in the prevalence of iron-related complications between patients with beta thalassemia major and hemoglobin E beta thalassemia. Next, we performed a detailed analysis of trends of serum ferritin in a subset of pediatric patients with beta thalassemia. The trend of mean serum ferritin plotted longitudinally at yearly intervals showed a rapid rise in serum ferritin during the first five years of life before reaching a plateau, plateau. Importantly, in most patients, serum ferritin was greater than 1000 even before they were two years old. These findings suggest that the body iron control is suboptimal in most patients, especially during the first five years of life emphasizing the need for intensifying iron chelation during first years of life. Importantly, we believe that the assessment of iron overload and iron chelation should not be delayed until the child receives the 10th transfusion as stipulated by the Thalassemia International Federation, but should be performed much earlier, preferably after 5th to 6th blood transfusion. Also, the threshold for commencement of iron chelation should be lowered for patients with transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia to avoid a rapid rise in serum ferritin during first few years of life. Quality of life The outlook of beta thalassemia has remarkably transformed during the last decade from a life-threatening fatal disease to a chronic disease with disability. Consequently, uplifting quality of life has become important in the management of beta thalassemia more than ever. Therefore, in our next study, we evaluated the quality of life in patients with transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. We used previously validated Pediatric Quality of Life Inventory 4.0 to determine the quality of life. This tool assesses quality of life in four dimensions, physical, emotional, social, and school functioning. The score, the score for each category range from 0 to 100, with higher scores representing better quality of life. For comparison, we recruited a randomly selected group of children without chronic diseases from the same hospitals as con for this study as controls. A total of 271 regularly transfused patients with beta thalassemia and 254 non-thalassemia controls were recruited. Age and sex distributions of patients and controls were similar. Comparison of quality of life between two groups revealed significantly lower mean quality of life scores in patients with beta thalassemia compared to controls in all dimensions. This was not surprising considering 
the chronic nature of the disease and the amount of physical and psychological stress that these patients have to undergo. Next, we compared the quality of life among patients with beta thalassemia major and HBE beta thalassemia. It reveals significantly lower quality of life scores in emotional functioning and social functioning in patients with HBE beta thalassemia compared to beta thalassemia major. This is rather unexpected given the fact that HBE beta thalassemia is considered as a relatively minor disease. However, as discussed earlier, regularly transfused patients with HBE beta thalassemia in Sri Lanka were in states of chronic anemia despite transfusions. We believe this has most likely contributed to lower quality of life in patients with HBE beta thalassemia. Then we attempted to identify the associations and determinants of quality of life among beta thalassemia patients. In this analysis, we found that patients who underwent splenectomy and were short or underweight had significantly lower quality of life scores. Similarly, longer hospital stays and lower paternal education and occupation levels were significantly associated with poor quality of life. These results are published in our next paper in journal Health and Quality of Life Outcomes. Psychological Health In the final research study presented in this oration, we assessed the prevalence of psychological symptoms among patients with beta thalassemia. We use previously validated strengths and difficulties questionnaire that measures psychological health among five scales, psychological symptoms among five scales. That is emotional symptoms, conduct symptoms, hyperactivity symptoms, peer relationship problems and pro-social behaviors. Of the 288 patients studied, Abnormal emotional conduct and hyperactivity symptom scores were reported by 18%, 17% and 9% of children with transfusion dependent beta thalassemia. 14% had abnormal peer relationship scores. Patients with HBE beta thalassemia reported significantly higher prevalence of abnormal conduct symptom scores compared to patients with beta thalassemia major. Next, we examine the clinical and socio-demographic factors associated with abnormal psychological symptom scores using logistic regression. A significantly higher proportion of children with suboptimal pre-transfusion hemoglobin levels and abnormal, had abnormal conduct and peer relationship scores. The presence of hypothyroidism and undernutrition was significantly associated with abnormal conduct scores while short stature was associated with abnormal emotional and hyperactivity symptom scores. Finally, we examine the relationship between maternal depression and psychological symptoms among patients with transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. Maternal depression in this study was assessed using the previously validated Center for Epidemiological Studies depression scale. This analysis revealed that high depression symptom scores in mothers were significantly associated with abnormal psychological symptom scores of children with beta thalassemia. These results are published in our paper in PLOS One. Conclusions and recommendations. Ladies and gentlemen, in this oration, I presented the results of several studies done in one of the largest cohorts of pediatric patients in beta thalassemia in Sri Lanka, maybe in the world. Here, we attempted to resolve several outstanding issues related to transfusion therapy, iron overload, quality of life, and psychological health in these patients. Based on the results which were just presented, I make the following conclusions and recommendations regarding medical management of patients with transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. 1. 
Despite receiving high transfusion volumes, most patients with hemoglobin E beta thalassemia were in states of chronic anemia. This is likely to be related to non-uniform practices of individual units due to lack of specific guidelines. Therefore, until specific guidelines for HbE beta thalassemia are developed, all patients with HbE beta thalassemia who requires regular transfusions more frequently than six weekly should be managed similar to beta thalassemia major with transfusions to maintain pre-transfusion hemoglobin between 9 to 10.5 grams per deciliter. However, I must re-emphasize that this should not be confused with a large group of patients with hemoglobin E beta thalassemia who requires no or occasional transfusions, the mild group of hemoglobin E beta thalassemia. These patients should continue to be managed as non-transfusion dependent beta thalassemia without transfusions and the requirement for transfusion should be decided individually without being purely based on hemoglobin levels. Over one-fifth of children with beta thalassemia were infected with hepatitis C. This raises huge concerns on the safety of blood products and the moral responsibility of caring physicians who swear Hippocratic Oath, above all, do no harm. Therefore, ensuring the safety of transfused blood is of paramount importance. Three, trends of serum ferritin revealed a rapid rise during the first five years of life, emphasizing the need for intense iron chelation during first few years of life. Assessment, of, assessment and management of iron overload should not be delayed, but be performed earlier than previously recommended, preferably after five to six blood transfusions. Similarly, the threshold for commencement of iron chelation should be lowered to avoid a rapid rise in serum ferritin during the first few years of life. 4. Assessment of iron-related complications are also suboptimal at present. As a result, patients may be picked at very late stages of organ dysfunction, especially in the heart and liver. Although organ-specific iron load can be assessed using MRI-based techniques locally, the accessibility to these facilities are limited. Therefore, these facilities should be decentralized to areas where it is required most. 5. Despite improved management, patients with beta thalassemia still experience a poor quality of life and have abnormal psychological symptom scores. This is more pronounced in the subset of patients with HbE beta thalassemia. It is timely as caring physicians, we direct our emphasis to take appropriate steps to improve the standards of living and quality of life of these patients. 6. Although not elaborated in this oration, there are many aspects that we can improve at the national level. Thanks to the effort by individual researchers, we already know that there are approximately 1,800 patients with beta thalassemia in Sri Lanka. However, we still do not have a national thalassemia registry. Despite lengthy discussions over several decades and several initial attempts, we have not been able to produce a registry. Therefore, I believe that the patient database of this study and the island-wide survey conducted previously should be transformed into a patient registry with the support of all healthcare professionals taking care of patients with beta thalassemia. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, in this oration, I have highlighted several important issues that hinders improvement in morbidity and mortality of patients with beta thalassemia in Sri Lanka. I sincerely hope these recommendations, I sincerely hope the recommendations made today will improve the standards of care and quality of life of patients with beta thalassemia in Sri Lanka. 
This will enable them to live a near normal life until a permanent cure accessible to all patients with beta thalassemia becomes available, hopefully in the very near future. The work presented today would not have been possible without the support of many in our research team. My sincere thanks goes to a bunch of very efficient research assistants, namely Drs. Hashan Patiraja, Ravindu Piris, and Nitmi Vikramasinghe, who were involved in the collection of data and maintaining patient databases. My departmental colleague, Tharindi Surya Perima, carried out the study on iron overload while Dr. Muru Chandradasa was instrumental in designing the study on psychological morbidity. Thank you very much for both of you. None of this work would have been possible without the continued support from Dr. Dayananda Bandara and Dr. Uday De Silva, consultants in charge of thalassemia centers of Kurunagala and Radhapur, and the staff in all three thalassemia centers. Also, I sincerely acknowledge the support, guidance, and the scientific input from Professor Anuja Premavardhana throughout these studies and beyond. Finally, my heartfelt gratitude goes to my wife Chamila and kids Kalle and Kaushala for being understanding and encouraging at all times. Thank you.